good evening, everyone. Um, oh, yes. Um, just a just a quick announcement before we start. Um, we are trying something new this year uh, in terms of our sign-in. So, if you've been here in the past, we just passed around a, a piece of paper to have you sign in, and um, this time we're going to pass around two iPads uh, around the uh, around to everyone, and it should be very easy <laughs> uh, <laughs> to sign in um, you don't have to do you don't have to find anything you will receive the iPad and it will have the, the little form on it and you will just type in using your fingers if you need any help do not feel bad I'm very happy to come and help you um, and I really really ap appreciate your your patience with this um, and just to give you a little bit of background on this um, if you're signing into the talk tonight, it's not gonna add your name to every mailing list ever <laughs> on earth. Um, it won't even add your name to the Vermont Humanities mailing list. We will um, send you an email tomorrow with, the, um, with a survey about the talk tonight. And really we want, we want as many responses as possible because this is just very, very important to us. We want to bring you the programming that is best for you. So we really love some feedback, and this is going to be able to give that to us. So um, when you are signing in, you just put your information in, um, as much as you feel comfortable putting in, and you click Submit, and that is it. Then it is magically <laughs> sent off into the cloud. And um, if, yeah, again, if you have any questions or any issues, you can just, um, just kind of signal to me or, or to Star, and we're happy to help you. So thank you. And, and in order to get the keyboard, you just put your finger uh, <coughs> to where you want to type, and it magically pops up. Thank super easy. <laughs> we won't give you one. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's the first, first Wednesday, so it must be fall in Brattleboro. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, we are so excited to start this series again this year, and we have a great, great lineup. Um, first, I want to thank a couple people or a couple groups. Uh, as you know, these events would not happen without the support of your friends and mine, the friends of Burke's Memorial Library. So please. Um, Thank them when you see them. If you are a friend, thank you so much. If you'd like to be a friend, I can certainly help you do that. Uh, we also have other sponsors. Um, our series underwriter is Chroma Technology. Um, the underwriters for this program that we're having tonight are Carol and Jeff Gaddis, who are here in the audience in the house, so please give them a hand. We also want to thank our library sponsors who are Against the Grain, Brattleboro Auto Body and Detailing, Brattleboro Retreat, Everyone's Books, GPI Construction, and you see our beautiful new ceiling, thanks to them, um, New Chapter, The Richards Group, The Vermont Country Store, and Wyndham World Affairs Council. So these are all people that have um, contributed to make this series happen, and we're so grateful. Please do mention it to them if you, if you uh, avail yourself of their businesses or their services, or if you're a member of, of any of these groups. So let's give them a big hand. Really, really lucky that for this first first Wednesday, the new person who is the first Wednesday coordinator, brand new, chose to come to this program for her first program. So I'm just saying that's how good Brattleboro is. So I am happy to introduce you to Gina Robinson. Thank you, Star. That's that's wonderful, and um, thank you for that little introduction. I um, I am very very excited to be at my first first Wednesdays, <laughs> and um, I've I've worked very hard for the past six months to to put all of this together. And for each site, I've really spent a lot of time thinking about your community and what you're interested in and what you would like to have. And um, as I mentioned when I was talking about the, the iPad signups, um, we absolutely take all of your feedback, good or bad, 
into account when we um, when we are working on our season. So um, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm excited to introduce our speaker. Amr Latif has been a professor of religious studies at Marlboro College since 2003. He's interested in issues surrounding cultural translation and has published translations on the poetry of Jalaluddin Rumi, uh, the 13th century Muslim scholar and mystic. He's currently working on two books. The first one, Only God is Good, Islam in the Words of Jesus, and the second one, Reading the Quran with Rumi. Um, I've actually seen a number of talks that um, Professor Latif has given, and um, I'm very, very excited. He's a, um, a, a very engaging speaker. And uh, having grown up in Pakistan with an undergraduate degree in physics, Amer thrives on studying and creating containers that are capacious enough to hold seeming contradictions such as science and religion, East and West. So please help me welcome Amr Latif. Good evening, friends and uh, neighbors and colleagues. <laughs> Um, what a pleasure to be here with you and I just want to start off by also expressing my gratitude to all of you for coming this evening and um, to um, the Vermont Humanities Council for uh, keeping uh, these spacing spaces open in our community where exchange of ideas can take place. Um, it's something untangible but something one of the most powerful things one can do is to be able to expose oneself to difference and new ideas and to be changed as a result. So sitting here uh, listening to me speak for a while I hope is not going to be uh, too tax taxing a task and I hope that we will actually engage while I'm talking and then um, more than anything I'm also looking forward to um, hearing what you have to uh, say about some of the ideas I present. <clears throat> um, I guess this is a personal note but before I started graduate school, I used to sit in those carols up there in 1994 and study Persian. And this was before I could read Rumi <laughs> in the original. So Brooks Memorial has a very sweet spot in my heart. <laughs> um, so thank you to the library for continuing its uh, wonderful uh, mission. And uh, also uh, gratitude to uh, BCTV who uh, provides, tapes these talks and then uh, plays them on public access to make it available to everybody. So thank you. Yeah. Um, the title of this talk, Approaching Islam, Approaching Difference, um, was um, really born out of the times that we are living in. I think it's rare that there's any moment in history where there's not strife, where there's not disagreement, where there's not injustice. But sometimes, it reaches a level and a pitch and an intensity that one cannot help but be preoccupied with it. And I think a lot of us for the last three or four years have been very much preoccupied um, with the issue of difference, diversity. What does it mean to live together with each other? What does it mean to live with those who, some of whose views are just so different that it's hard for us to imagine how somebody could think that. So I've been thinking about it, like all of you, and um, these are some thoughts uh, on the topic. And my goal in um, giving this talk was, uh, it's twofold. One is to use this as an opportunity to present Islam to all of you through the lens of difference, through the lens of what the Quran has to say about diversity, a couple of stories, first personal stories, how they might illuminate um, how Muslims might sit, make sense of diversity um, so that it's a kind of a shortened introduction to Islam, a little snapshot of what Islam uh, might offer us, or might offer the people who think through it, practice it in a way of living with difference. And the second one is um, that I want us to use this opportunity just like learning a foreign language. I think religion sometimes and other cultures are like foreign languages. And just like learning a foreign language, if you've tried that, you must have had that moment where um, you learn some kind of a grammatical construction in another language and you realize, oh, but English says it differently. So there's a moment where when we encounter the other, when we try to learn about the other, it makes us more aware of who we are. 
So I hope, and this is the, for the last half of the uh, talk tonight, and hopefully in our uh, conversation afterwards when I'm done sharing my remarks, um, that we can ask ourselves what kind of insights does looking at Islam give us on our own situation? Because that really is the concern that I think all of us <laughs> are living with. It's not just to learn about Islam, whatever it is, but it's to learn about Muslims who are living in our society, but also can it ask, can it help us studying Islam, knowing about Islam? Can it help us to ask fresher questions, different questions? I'm going to be curious to ask, to hear from you how what I have to share might have changed or shifted how you have thought about diversity, how you have thought about difference, and what possibilities it might propose to us. So it's very open-ended in that way. Let me uh, begin with, a, with an anecdote. Um, as I was thinking of uh, this talk, it was very clear to me what, um, what kind of uh, a beginning I wanted to have. Well, a couple of years ago, I um, went to Pakistan with my family to visit my father. And uh, we were sitting um, in front of the TV late night. The kids had gone to sleep. And uh, as he likes to do, he was watching one of his uh, favorite political talk shows. And I was hanging out with him. And this particular evening, there were, it was a fairly heated exchange going on, primarily because there was this one person um, who was just remarkable. Remarkable in that he was so extreme <laughs> that the obtuse statements that kept coming out of this guy's mouth were just like jaw-dropping. One could not believe how this person on national TV was defying logic, common sense, and the considered social norms, the kind of uh, social agreement that is just normal. This person was really pushing the envelope to such a degree that I literally, I think my mouth was just wide open, like, wow, what is going on, what this guy just said. And when this person made some really <laughs> strange point, my father's response was a classic Muslim expression, and he said, which we Muslims say at moments of wonder and astonishment, he said, Subhanallah. Subhanallah means glory be to God. In this context, it can also be glossed at, isn't it ama amazing what God can make? <laughs> you know, so it was a statement that simultaneously expresses strong disagreement, right? And it's also bewilderment at one's inability to actually understand how can this person think this way. And as I was thinking about this talk, it's really those moments, those embodied situations that I want us to access. How it is that we actually experience disagreement and difference in our bodies. At that moment where we feel like, are we the same species? Like we don't see a way into being able to look at the world just like another human being is looking and seeing in front of us. And that's almost, that's a deadlock. So that's an extreme situation. So I was, you know, reminded of this uh, situation and I um, asked him, you know, um, why are you saying subhanallah at this station? Of course, I knew that that's what he was saying, but he said to me that, you know, difference is a sign of God. Difference is a sign of God. Um, and by using subhanallah, or saying glory be to God, um, I think what he was doing, and I think what that phrase does, is it moves that interaction from an absolute judgment of the person. That you are illogical. You are not making sense. You are dense. And you can keep on thinking further along that spectrum of what else might, might we call that person in our heads <laughs> and feel it in our guts what we like to tell that person, right? So that kind of an absolute judgment in which there is two, one facing another, to say, glory be to God, look at what God has made, what God is capable of making. A third element is introduced at that moment. So that absolute judgment is thereby relativized. And relativized, I think, in the sense of relating it to something, not letting it stand on its own as a sui generis kind of phenomenon that we have no access to. All of a sudden, we have access to that being, the person, as a creature of God. We have found a way 
to make them not just obtuse, not just dense, not just somebody who just cannot see the right thing. They are still a creature of God. So that was the work, I think, that that statement did in that moment. So I think by invoking God, my father was creating a space big enough to contain his disappointment, disbelief, disagreement, and incapacity to understand what that man had said. And this was a space big enough to contain differences. And you know, like I just said, when I brought it up with him, his response was that, yes, difference and diversity are the biggest signs of God. And I was so moved by this at that moment that my dear friend Meg Maud is here, and she's a big believer in commonplace books. I actually made a commonplace book entry about it. I wrote a whole page and a half of reflection on that statement. Difference is a sign of God. So it stuck with me. And then um, as a scholar of religion, specifically as a scholar of Islam, somebody who does study the Quran, um, he was based right in the Quranic worldview. Here's uh, a passage from the Quran, a very sample passage. And um, God is saying, among his signs are the creation of the heavens and the earth and the variation in your tongues and colors. In that are signs for those who know. Variation in your tongues and colors. What might we add to that? Variation in your tongues and colors, your body odors, your tastes. Just think about that, right? Think about the moment at which your brain has shut down and your body has taken over when you've experienced difference. Think about that moment where it seems as if our reaction is not in our control. I think those kinds of data we need to populate this idea with. In the variation of your tongues and colors are signs for those who know. What are we supposed to know? What kind of a knowledge is this? It's, it's left open, but there's a certain knowledge that allows us to see it as more than itself, right? I was saying that there's two. You are this. You know, my dad could have said to this guy, that this guy is so dense, but he said, subhanAllah. So he made that guy, through that action, something that points towards the beyond. There's something beyond that person. Again, that thing which is bigger than both my dad and that person, or between me and somebody else that I encounter who is different than me. Difference in shapes, colors, sizes, you know, differences in tastes, in opinions, all kinds of differences. Think of all the differences that we encounter day to day. And another chronic verse with a similar idea. This is a theme that's repeated a fair bit in the Quran. O humans, we created you from a male and a female. And we made you peoples and tribes that you may come to know each other. There's a causality that's been given in terms of Aristotle's final cause. If we were to ask, why this? Why make things different? The answer is there. So that you may come to know each other. It's like saying, hey, you have to learn a foreign language so that you may come to know your own language. That would be a good argument in public schools, right? <laughs> to teach a foreign language. <laughs> Difference is great in that way. And then the most noble of you before God are the ones most aware of Him. So there's differences. This is the situation of the world. And yet, there are also ranks. People are ranked in degrees as well. And what is the criteria for this ranking, at least in this verse? The criteria is that those who are most aware of God are the ones who are most noble among human beings. God is knowing, aware, and the connection is drawn between our awareness and God's awareness. So let us consider the range of feelings, once again, generated in us when we observe difference. Let's think through the range of your experiences of encountering others in the human and non-human domain. Joy, fear, revulsion, curiosity. These are some of the feelings that arise when we see others who are different than us. 
And these feelings have to be processed, have to be named, and need to work with them. But what kind of names do we give them? That's part of the question. That's what I'm trying to present here, is that from a Quranic worldview, within the Quranic uh, frame, God is teaching you what kind of names to give them. Name this thing God's creature. Don't just name this as another person. Names make a difference in this case. Even a name, one name, has a whole story within it. Um, and at this stage, I feel it's um, important to think about what needs come up if we feel joy, fear, revulsion, whatever it is when we encounter difference, what are the needs that are, we are seeking to be fulfilled? What are the needs that are coming up through that encounter? You know, we're human beings. We have, you know, various bodily needs and all lead levels of meaning as well. Um, but one thing that I feel is helpful in thinking about it, that helps me in thinking about this, is that um, we tend to overestimate, research shows, the degree to which others think like us. This is a fairly common phenomenon that has been measured quite well across culture. So it's a, like a trans-cultural uh, phenomenon that human beings tend to um, overestimate the degree to which others think like us. Our opinions, we think that our opinions, beliefs, preferences, values, and habits are normal and typical of other people. So uh, social scientists, researchers have coined a term for this. It's called the false consensus effect. And research bears this out. So what does this say about our needs, you know? I think the benefits of the false consensus consist in, and it points to this idea that if we feel that others think like us, then we have an increased sense of social validation. We feel like we're more supported socially, right? And we feel better about ourselves that way as well. So this is an interesting situation. At one stage, there's so much difference if you look at our experience, we see how people are different, and yet we tend to tell ourselves that more people think like us than they do. Um, and I think I'm really interested in this desire for agreement and this taste for disagreement. It's the story that we tell ourselves that others, you know, they, they think like us, or we imagine them to think like us. We, perhaps we delude ourselves in that. So there's this need to feel good about ourselves, and it's tied to what others think of us, you know and agreement with other leads to support and validation. So, if we think of human beings developmentally, imagine a baby, totally dependent on the mother and caregivers, and slowly the baby grows, and grows into all of us who are sitting here. There's a story that we tell ourselves, we say that we have become independent. I think it's one of the, you know, uh, stories of growing up. Yeah, in some ways we are independent. We don't need anybody to feed us anymore. You know, we don't need anybody to take care of, do our laundry and stuff. But those inner bonds are still necessary. We need that support of others. We need to feel connected to others. And it's that need that gets thwarted by looking at difference, at least in my experience. And for me, um, some of the most shocking moments in recent years um, have been the times where people I did not expect to disagree with me. Have we had that experience sometimes? One of those was a dear, dear friend of mine, and I was just going on and on about something. I think it was something political. And then he just asked one question, and it was as if, you know, whatever wave I had been riding, you know, it just disappeared. It crashed. And it was that moment of realizing that we don't agree as much as I thought we did. He is not me. It was really funny and sad and hard at the same time. So I think people who are closest to us, that's where we might feel the shock the most. Because we expect it with people we don't know. But I think we can pay attention to these moments where these differences arise. Um, So, now that we have this context, we have the bodily, biological context, we have, um, you know, the situation, we can call it a transcultural situation, the embodied situations in which we experience and how we experience difference, we can look at um, the way in which the Quran answers this question <laughs> of difference in a slightly different way. 
So at your most frustrating moment, you might ask yourself, as I have many times, why did it have to be this way? <laughs> no. <laughs> why so much difference? Why could things not have been easier or simpler? And there's God. He's saying, yes, I hear you. Good question. Had, had your Lord willed, he would have made mankind one community. And you're like, but why didn't you? So here's the answer. But they don't stop differing. This is a really interesting phrase there. It's like they continue to differ. It's like they will not stop differing. And the differ difference there is of all kinds of difference. But the word they're differing is specifically in the context that it was used. is about differences of opinion, about scriptural stuff. That's what the Quran is talking about. It's talking about the disagreement of Muslims with Christians and Jews. Had your Lord willed, he would have made mankind one community. But they don't stop differing. Even God is slightly amazed. But they don't stop differing. Except those on whom your Lord has mercy. And for this he created them. So the close readers among you will find this very interesting. There's certain ambiguities here in this uh, text. You know, God could have made mankind one community, but why didn't he? Is it possible that what would, have been, what would it have been like to be just one? I wonder, would it have been like uh, in the plant kingdom, like basil plants or some species? They're all the same. Like, is the basil here different than the basil over there? What's the individuality of a basil? Or of chickens for that matter? <laughs> Amoeba, are they one? Are there things in this world that we can actually say are actually one community? Or are they all different? I mean, there's really a lot of emphasis in contemporary scholarship, especially in contemporary philosophy, which is pointing at the particularity of each and everything. We love this. We are, I think, a, a generation right now very much in tune with particularity and difference and celebrating those differences, which seems to be indicated by this chronic position. But the other side of it is really interesting, too, that God is positing. We could have been one. What would have life, life been like if everybody had been one? But the closest I can come is thinking about going into a hall of mirrors. It just would be one person. Everything would just look the same, right? You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So it's kind of unimaginable, perhaps. Is that, does that make sense? Is it a little bit unimaginable for us to, even that mirrors, you need mirrors to reflect back. What would we like to be in a place where everything is the same? There's of course many dream sequences in movies, right? Where sometimes you find yourself in a place where everything is you. Which is true of our psyche, I guess. Whatever we've seen in our dreams is just an aspect of ourselves. So we might as well just give them the same face, but then it loses all distinction. Everything is the same, everything is like each other. You know? Um, it's really interesting actually from the materialist perspective to think about that. As uh, Gina was mentioning, I studied physics in undergraduate. And I think if you were to just take a materialist perspective and think about a physicist studying the world. The physicist is sitting there saying, these the thing that I'm studying is made out of molecules and it's made out of these kinds of things. This is its structure. And all of a sudden they realize that, but I too am made out of the same molecules. So is that thing studying me, or am I studying that thing? Because we're the same, at least, in terms of the physical material. So from that perspective, strangely, actually there is unity. It's just that we don't access it, but in fact, if everything is made out of the same stuff, there is a certain level of unity. And yet we have this diversity. So a couple of things about this, um, that humans, it seems like God willed it because there's some reason for it. And we've already seen some of the reasons that God wanted people to come to know each other. God wanted people to learn foreign languages so they realize what their own languages are like and what their own idiosyncrasies are like, right? Um, and the other one is that there are, it seems, a group of people who are able to bypass, somehow able to see through the differences and not be um, taken over by them. And one specific commentator talks about these people as the ones who hold on to the roots of the religion. 
to the unity of existence, to the unity of God, and see that as the root, and see differences as uh, the branches, rather than the root. So they're able to distinguish between the branches from the roots. Um, so this is a situation that we find ourselves in. We're both similar and we're dissimilar. Sometimes we feel so connected to people. <coughs> Whether we're dinner with friends, we're like, well, that was lovely, we just really felt connected. Other times we'll be like, I don't know how we're friends, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a yo-yo that goes back and forth between feeling connected and feeling disconnected. Being overcome by difference, being pushed back by it, feeling alienated, or feeling like, oh, we're just one. We are one. We are indeed one community, you know? And it's a lot of times uh, physical activities like dancing or, you know, doing stuff together that's rhythmic, that tends to dissolve those boundaries of uh, cognition that make us feel separate from each other. So there are domains and places where we feel connected, but at the same time, there are those other ones too. So here, here we are going back and forth. Um, so I think it can start to wear on us humans, you know, who find consolation in certainties. We want some certainties. <laughs> you want your favorite cereal there in the morning or the morning day is shot, right? Whatever your morning ritual is. <laughs> we need certain, you know, those certainties. So our brain is designed um, by God, by nature, whatever you want to call it, um, to spend as little time as possible on mental operations in getting around the world. That's why stereotypes exist. You just make a snap judgment. Immediately you see an outline of a thing, you know, I'm not looking at over there, it's just a stack of books. I can really focus in into a book and I can find more about it, but for general purposes, it's enough to make those snap judgments. So that's what our brains are designed to do. Thinking actually takes effort and that's why, you know, it's hard and our brains hurt when we have to work hard. Um, <laughs> Some of my students say that. You're making my brain hurt. I'm like, that's good. <laughs> that means we're getting somewhere. <laughs> um, so this dizziness that can be caused by this situation um, is then again addressed by the Quran in a similar version, a different verse with the same idea. And had God willed, he would have made you one community, but he willed otherwise, so that he might test you in what he has given you. How many of you guys graduated? We thought school was over. <laughs> what is this unending school? Test. So he might test you in what he has given you. So compete with one another in good works. This is the unending school of life, I guess. That's what we were being presented. Um, you know, it's the, I thought, you know, we could get jobs now, enjoy life. That's what the Constitution says, life, liberty, happiness. You're telling me I have to keep on taking these tests. And that's it. Yes, life is a test. And whatever is given, it seems, according to this vision, is a test. If a hardship has been given to you, that's a test. But if you have wealth, that's a test as well. If you're a minority, that's a test. If you're in the majority, that's a test. If you're a minority, just to take the example of some of the debates that are going on, how do you find the most beautiful, good works how do you find the best way of dealing with the oppression that has been put upon your group and yet not be consumed by it? If you're in the majority group, how do you work to secure and set right those injustices without giving in to the self-flagellation and the kind of um, sort of uh, sinfulness that sometimes is now prevalent in uh, some of the majority groups as well? What does it mean? So it's a test for everybody. Whether you're privileged or disprivileged, minority or majority, everybody has their test. There's nobody coming out of it. So, what is it? It's a game. So compete, literally it has the connotation in Arabic of racing. So race with each other to see who is going to do better works. That's the race, the race to good works. And we'll talk a little bit about it um, later on what this can look like in specific situations. Yes, so other people get in the way of our, the pursuit of our happiness. You know, our freedom gets constrained by the presence of those who look different, act different, and by their very presence demand more of us than what we might feel capable of giving. So, abstractly speaking then, 
let's summarize what we have done so far. According to the Quran, there is no end to this difference. Even if things could have been otherwise, the design of this universe is such that difference is not going to disappear. And in this framework, difference is a sign of God. It points beyond itself to a unity, the one who has created everything. And the purpose of this difference is to know each other. And the purpose of this difference is to play the game of good works. That's the framework. So now we can go back to that story that I began with, my father's response, <laughs> particularly <laughs> irritating and dense uh, commentator. Glory be to God. Look at what God can make. I am incapable of going into it, but let me do the good thing and at least not negate the individuality of that person or the fact, at least recognize that they're a creature of God, so God has hidden purposes. Let me just, you know, back off with that. Um, so this is the worldview, you know, that, that the Quran gives us at a general and abstract level. And, but general discussions, as you're all, you know, um, can attest to it, you know, they appeal to our reason, but they don't really fire our imagination that much. Um, so the Quran also tells us about the purpose of difference and diversity, you know, through showing it to us in a story and what this dynamic looks like and what does it mean to come to know each other and come to know oneself through the process. And I'm just going to briefly describe this. This is a Quranic story of Adam and Eve, the first humans. So the first humans are created for Adam and Eve come about. So there are three characters. God is a character too in this story, but you know, the ones who really end up learning a lot are Adam and Eve, the humans, Iblis, who used to be an angel, but becomes Satan, and all the rest of the angels. So how we learn through difference. So the Quran says, everything has been created, but the human being has not yet been created. So God calls all the angels into his presence and tells them, I am about to put a representative on earth. And the angels, through their knowledge of what they have, say, what, are you going to put somebody there who's going to spread corruption and shed blood? Right on, right? Yeah, the angels could see that. And God tells them, I know something that you do not know. So God creates Adam. And God teaches Adam all the names. And then there's like a contest over there. God brings the angels over. Adam is standing there. And the things, whatever the names have been taught, those things are brought. And God asks the angels, okay, tell me the names of these things. And they are said, glory be to you. Same word, subhanallah, they say, use. Glory be to you. We do not know what you have not taught us. We only know what you have taught us. We do not know this. And then God tells Adam, okay, Adam, tell them the names. And Adam, you know, it's just, you can just imagine, just rattles off the names at that moment. And that's why one of the titles of Adam, or the human being in the Islamic tradition, is the teacher of angels. So at that moment, God asks all the angels to bow down in front of Adam. You only bow down to those who are higher than you. Isn't that remarkable? Angels are being asked to bow down in front of Adam. And all of them do that, except one. His name was Iblis. Huh. His name is Iblis, I know, and God asks him, why don't you, why haven't you bowed down to the one whom I have created with my own two hands? Showing a real connection to Adam. Um, and he says, I'm better than he is. Like, why? Because Adam is made out of clay and I'm made out of fire. So it turns out Iblis actually was a jinn, beings made out of fire, who through his love of God and his worship was raised to the rank of angels. So he was in the rank of angels, but he was not actually a being made out of light. He was being made out of fire. So it was light-like, but not pure light. So there was that element in him. So he uh, refuses to bow down. So God says, you're kicked out of heaven. And he gets kicked out. Out of, out of God's presence. And then Adam and Eve are brought to the garden, and they're hanging out, and God tells them, eat of everything except that tree. So the Quran is very similar to the biblical story in this case. And then, of course, Satan appears and tells Eve, you know, if you eat of that tree, you will become immortal. God doesn't want you to eat. So she talks to Adam and they both eat of the fruit. And the same thing happens. As soon as they eat, their eyes are open. They have become aware of their nakedness. And this soul 
um, little garments out of uh, leaves to put on the bodies. And uh, then God comes and uh, also takes Adam and Eve to task and kicks them out of the garden as well. I forgot one little detail, not little, but quite important, that before Iblis or Satan is kicked out of God's presence, he displays his displeasure and says, that, that says to God, now that you have caused me to go astray, now that you, God, now that God, you have misguided me, give me permission so I can misguide Adam and his children as well. So God gives him permission. So that's why he shows up in the garden, because he is now actually working on God's behalf, I guess. So Adam gets kicked out as well. The beast is already, you know, kicked out. So there's this estrangement of this family. Angels are the ones who are the ones who are still close to God, but at least as estranged, and Adam, Adam and Eve were estranged. After a while, some sources say after hundreds of years, Adam and Eve receive an inspiration from God. And this inspiration is to turn towards God and ask for forgiveness. And they do that. But they do that in a very interesting way. That is the exact opposite of what Iblis says. Iblis, who becomes Satan, says, now that you have caused me to go astray, saying that God, you are responsible. But he's right, you know, because God created everything. So God is responsible. So that's why Iblis, or Satan, is also called the first philosopher in the Islamic tradition. <laughs> it's a nice syllogism, you know. You created me, and uh, so you're responsible. So what do Adam and Eve say? They say to God, Oh, our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If you don't turn towards us and have mercy, surely we will be among the losers. So then God turns towards them, forgives them, and raises Adam and Eve again to the rank of prophets. So, can you see how before Adam came into the picture, before there was just the world, it was a difference too, I guess. Everything else had been created. Angels were there, but there was no self-knowledge. What did the angels learn through this experience? They learned the level of their own knowledge. And they realized that they did not have the capacity to bear something that God had to teach. That there was another creature who apparently looked like it was stinky, made out of mud, you know, but in fact could bear, could carry something that was really remarkable, that made this being, human being, much higher than the angels. What did Iblis find out? I mean, his is the most tragic story in some ways. Because there he was, close to God, and all of a sudden it turns out his function was to be Satan. He had to become the misguider. He had to live a life of distance from God. And what do Adam and Eve find out? That even though they know all the names and they've been <laughs> angels that bowed down to them, they have also the capacity to fall down. But they also find out that there are two options. One is the option of Satan, who blames God and says at a distance. The other option is to recognize one's own part in the play and ask for forgiveness and repair the relationship. This is not in the Quran, but it is picked up this point in later tradition. And Rumi says this very beautifully. Rumi has this, builds up and expands the dialogue between uh, God and uh, Adam and Eve. And God asks Adam, after everything's been forgiven, you know, and they're sitting there chatting away, I guess. Uh, God says, Adam, you had every reason to take me to task. After all, I have, I'm the maker of everything. You could have said, God, you created me. And Adam says, my love for you would not allow me to blame you, God. So that's why I acted that way. And God said, since you have acted beautifully towards me, let me also act beautifully towards you. So that's the lesson that Rumi draws from that story, is that repairing relationships sometimes requires to forego the truth, one truth, in favor of another truth. The truth that will repair versus the truth that will sever. Because both are there. In a sense, it's coming back to our discussion. Both difference is there and similarity is there. Which one are you going to focus on? It seems to be a choice that's given. Um, so, Everybody ends up learning something, and um, that's the way in which the Quran shows how difference, the presence of Adam in the heavenly court, ends up becoming the cause for the growth and self-knowledge of everybody involved. Adam and Eve, 
Iblis or Satan and the angels. So we're getting to our uh, 40 minute mark here. So let me just um, take us through a few reflections and questions that I want to propose and then we can start having a conversation. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I, on this reading was getting was that God understands that difference is hard. <laughs> It's not like we've been left here and said, hey, deal with that. No, we could have created. It seems to indicate that I know, I know, and I understand, but this is the reason why you're over here. You know, it's like somebody, for whatever test, you know, yes, studying is hard, or whatever kind of test you're gonna take. Yes, but unless you do this, this other thing is not going to happen. So there seems to be wisdom behind it, a wisdom that we can understand, a wisdom that we've all lived uh, in different forms, with different kinds of hard things. Um, and just going back to that example of um, my father's, that I feel like we need a bigger container, something that makes duality and turns duality into at least threeness, or can contain the me and you in itself. The subhanAllah, look at what God has made, is that container. And that something bigger than ourselves is needed for that unification. And that's the question I want to ask us to think about. What it is in our culture, what it is in our lives, in our relationships, that actually is bigger than all of us were involved in it. If it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship, what are the principles maybe? Or what is the container? What is the kind of story that we can share um, that might do this? Or is it actually necessary? I mean, I'd be very curious to hear if, you know, um, you think that it's not necessary. Yes. So, um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's uh, stay there and we can do some questions and answers now. Yeah. So we have the mic, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Amr. Um, I have a question, it's, it's what you said towards the end about in order to maintain relationships, we need to ignore one truth in favor of another truth. Yeah. And, and I was hearing in that that the first truth is the almost deterministic picture of the world. There's a cause for everything, and I didn't do this because I willed it. I did it because you made me do this. Yeah. Yeah. And Absolutely. It, I think you're putting the right uh, um, and, and then the other one, forgiveness, to it, yeah. is, is it more, I, I know, you said Iblis is the first philosopher, and I don't want to get too philosophical here, but yeah, I will say this. Um, but is then this other thing that you pay attention to, is it free will, or so you, are, is that what that is getting at? Get rid of, and use modern terms, get rid of structural explanations and take on personal, I don't know, I don't want to put too many words in this. Yeah, no, I think I, it's great to hear what you um, heard in there, Meg, and I agree, I think that's, those are some of the thoughts that go through my mind as well. It's hard not to think of those things when one is reading these pre-modern stories. But absolutely, that the, what Iblis says to God is that the structure has made me do it. I'm not responsible, you know. And what Adam's example shows is that even though the structure is responsible, right? I mean, that's the truth. That's by later Muslim thinkers, it's very clearly said, Rumi says that. But even in the Quran, God says that. Uh, he says, I have created you and what you do. It was mind-blowing for me the first time I encountered that, like as an adult, looking at that, seriously? So all of my mishaps are also created by you, God? I mean, it's, so how much clearer can you get? I have created you and what you do. I mean, that's just a, and this is a feature of Islam, actually, and the, as presented in the Quran. It does not shy away from putting the responsibility on God in the ultimate sense. Ultimately, of course, God is responsible, or whoever the source is that has given rise to what place we find ourselves in is responsible for the way things are. But within that determinism, there is a realm at which we seem to have choice. And I tend to think of it in terms of um, our actual lived experience. So when we are making a choice, usually we feel like we're responsible. If we feel we're responsible, if we don't doubt that I have free will, then we have free will. That's the answer that's usually being given, you know? Um, so, I mean, we have this fun exercise with students sometimes at Malware when we talk about free will and determination, and um, the idea that, you know, it doesn't really matter what you will get, and somebody will say and then say, okay, fine, then, 
you know, I'm not turning in that exam or I'm showing up for the exam. I'm not doing this paper for you. I'm like, that's great. I'm not giving you a grade for it either then. <laughs> it just balances itself out very clearly and it shows absurdity in some ways of taking that very logical approach that Iblis has taken because it denies his own role in choosing not to because anger flared up and he chose to be, you know, say that I am better than he is, right? So to now recover philosophy a little bit, not to just say that it's, you know, it's from the Sufi perspective, the contemplative perspective. Overemphasis on reason is a problem, but reason itself is a beautiful thing. Adam and Eve also use reason. I think they reason it out that it's better to admit mistake and repair the relationship rather than not. So I think that's a fairly reasoned position too. A lot of heart is involved as well, just like for Iblis, the emotion of pride and anger is involved. In the case of Adam, perhaps a little bit of sadness and a desire to connect is involved. So it's not like these reason is operating by itself. It's in the matrix of the body. So it's colored by those things. But still, I, I imagine Adam and Eve thinking it through as well. That it's better to um, make peace. And hence the name of the religion, making peace, right? <laughs> it's right there in the first story. Adam and Eve made peace with God. And it's Islam. Islam means making peace. Making peace with reality. Yes. Does that uh, get to what you were thinking? Yeah. So it's, it's a mixture. I think structure is important. And sometimes there are structures that even the Quran will say need to be replaced. In fact, Muhammad's mission was to replace certain structures. Especially structures that were objectifying people. Structures in which um, orphans, widows, the poor, the slaves were not taken care of. I cannot help this right now, but when I hear Bernie Sanders, I, am, I hear echoes of the Quran in that message. It's that level of just treating people as people, guaranteeing going to the uh, level at which you don't make a distinction among people based on what they have or what they have not. It's a classic prophetic image of uh, message also of the Old Testament too. The prophets coming and asking uh, the Hebrews to Israelites holding them accountable to their own standards. Yeah. Yeah. And then Star, there's somebody in the back as well afterwards, yeah. yeah. I'm really confused with free will. Where does free will come in? Did Let's do an experiment, Phil. All right. Or maybe you can stand up. Yeah, could you stand up, please? Can you raise your right leg? Yeah. Can you raise your left leg now? <laughs> so the first one is the free will and the second one is determination. <laughs> we are in situations which start out with multiple options and you take a decision and things start to narrow down. But the fact that you could raise that, that's the proof of free will. So to that degree, to a certain degree, you wouldn't be able to fly like Superman. I mean, that's you know, Unless you're in your dreams, yeah. Does that get to what you were thinking well, about? Did Adam and Eve have free will when they decided to eat the fruit, the Garden of Eden? Yeah. How do you think Adam and Eve would answer that question? I think that's the place to go rather than taking this perspective of sitting outside which makes us bigger than God, right? <laughs> what I think the stories do is they ask us to go inside because we live it through our bodies. We are living lives from here not going out there and saying, am I constrained or am I not constrained, right? In the moment at which, you know, we're interacting with loved ones or those that we're disagreeing with. In that moment we're here, we're not kind of somewhere else, right? So I think that's the place that these stories bring us to. That at that place it feels like we have some options. But sometimes, some options are gone as well. So that's where um, it's possible that there are conditions in which people are not capable of making the decision, something actually took over. In, in their body. But most of us usually, if you want to talk about normal, you know, there's, there's a level of uh, feeling that we can decide a choice. It's like, rather than being snarky to a dear one, a choice to be nicer. Like that choice seems to be there. Like I think we've all experienced that, where we can make that decision. I think it's that level, that ethical level, that lived experience that this story is bringing us to. So. In my reading, I think Adam and Eve would say that um, 
if we say that we don't want to have free will, that's us taking a much bigger and kind of a detached perspective. But when we were doing it, we thought we were doing it. So let's be true to what we thought we were doing. I thought I was doing it, you know? So that's the level. So in a sense, for me, it really actually dissolves a lot of these philosophical problems that are simply, I think, a result of trying to think like God and seeing whether the system is that or not. No, it's about our lived experience. Start behind you over there, yeah. Thank you. Um, you brought up the uh, uh, fact, the fact that uh, Adam and Eve um, in the garden, when they had sinned, and as in the Bible it also says, they hid from God and they uh, uh, recognized their nakedness and they covered themselves with fig leaves. Yeah. Uh, but God subsequently also then substituted those fig leaves with skins. Correct? Yeah, yeah. How do you interpret the skin and which to me at least means something had to die in order to bridge mm -hmm. that gap that he had that they had created. Yeah. And he provided a way and if you look at the biblical history right. throughout that he has always tried to provide a means of getting back to a relationship with him. And the ultimate relationship was, it was foreshadowing the death of Christ to take away the ultimate sin of man. That, that was the only yeah, way in the Christian, that, yeah. Christian reading, absolutely, that's all leading up to that one specific world historical event. Yeah. Um, so, if I could bring it back to the Quran over here, um, garments are spoken about quite explicitly. So that is also shown as a sign of God. It is He who has given you garments by which you cover yourselves so that you might ward off cold. So there's reasons given too. And then the Quranic verse goes on to say, but the garment of God weariness, awareness of God is the best garments of all. That you're aware of God. And that goes back to the biblical or the, the moment in the, um, you know, in the context of the story where Adam and Eve chose to eat of the fruit. At that moment, they had become unaware of God. Or they just were taken over by their own desire and hence became unaware. So the symbolism of the garment taken from, you know, as a protection is uh, used to, um, as a sign of God and it's also used as a way that one connects to God. So the symbol, the garment of God weariness, of God, awareness of God is the best garment. And there's another really beautiful passage in the Quran of uh, where the symbol of garments is used, where it says that we have created you of one soul, and then you become male and female, and you marry each other, and you are as garments to each other. Uh, you used the word garment, though. Uh, my point was that something had to die. Yes, I mean... Skin. You don't have a skin without having something die. Yeah, and I think that was the point... What's, what's your name? Sorry? Al. 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 Um, that was what I was trying to hint at, but I think your question allows us to actually bring it out uh, uh, in more detail. This issue of education. So, uh, in terms of learning, our ignorance has to die. Whatever we were at, we have to move on from it. So yes, something had to die. It, something died in the angels. Well, something physical had to die, not just a, an idea. Uh, that I'm not sure if I see that in the story, but the way in which the story is being told in the Quran at least, it seems like each one of them, a sense of self is dying and different sense of self is being reborn in which there's more self-knowledge that I am not just, for Adam and Eve, we're not just creatures who know a lot and who the angels are about to. You see yourself now also capable of going against God's will and as people who can, just like Iblis, be thrown away, right? And angels realize, we thought we were the only ones. We were closest to God, you know? Because their complaint, the fuller complaint was, are you gonna place somebody on earth who's gonna shed blood? and spread corruption while we call you holy and sing your praises. So that was their self-understanding that here we are, this is what our function is, and then they realize, oh wow, there's somebody else around who has come after us and yet is being honored above us. 
So something about the purpose of the cosmos even is revealed to the angels only through the presence of Adam. So, you know, something dying, I think, the stories point more towards that level of ignorance dying and new knowledge coming in, which is, it hurts, it's, it's discomfort, just like, you know, we're going, you know, sometimes friends say, this is an intervention or something, right? <laughs> it's that kind of a thing. If so, I may, if yeah. I may it, it, it's missing, I think, the big point, which is reconciliation with God required someone to pay for the sin, the sins that happened just that. In the case that, of the Quran, was, yeah, I, I hear you, Al. was the one that took that on himself yeah, to yeah. make that happen, if one believes him. Okay. Exactly, that and was, that's the Christian that's the story, and the Quran yeah. does not agree with that and, story. And there, exactly. Yeah, and I understand that. Uh, and yeah. the Quran. When did the Quran become about? When it was initiated? It came about six hundred years after Jesus' right. death, right? So Thank it, you. it is responding to, in fact, that idea and rejects that idea to say that each one of us has to take on our own sin and create our own relationship to God and ask for forgiveness by our own selves. Nobody can take on anybody else's sins. That's definitely part of the Quranic message. Yeah. I'm glad we clarified that. Yeah. Uh, what version of the Quran would you recommend that people read? I have the feeling many here have not read it. Yeah. Um, there's a new translation that has come up, um, which is called the Study Quran. Um, there's no perfect version of it, but what this does is it's by a team of scholars, and what they offer you is uh, one of the most recent translations, and also samples and some selections from some of the major commentators in the footnotes. So it, does the library have copies? Uh, if it didn't, I'm sure Star's going to arrange for it now. We can make it happen otherwise. <laughs> it's called the Study Quran. Yeah. This is a little bit off topic, but it came to me the other day. If everything, if everybody was good, and everything was good in the world, you'd never know. Because there'd be nothing to compare it with. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody was happy. You had everything you wanted. Yeah. You, you, you wouldn't appreciate it because you would never know. Right, yeah. There was a huge debate in Islamic uh, philosophy and theology. And Ghazali, in like 1111, he died in 1111 CE, he wrote a whole um, book arguing that this is the best possible world in order for good to exist because there has to be something that against which it matches itself. And this is what Iblis finds out, right? It's, that's why it's a tragic figure according to certain people because he didn't choose to be the villain, but in fact he needs to be there for human beings to be tested. <laughs> so, you know, he's the adversary that is demanded by this world of opposites and the world of difference. You have to have it there, have to have it, yes. So in that way, it's not a fair world. It just is. I might go around the next time and get a better <laughs> <laughs> But that's the whole point of what I was trying to make, that you could not design something better than this if you wanted to have free will, if you wanted to have people accountable and have them work for something, that this was the best possible world. Yes. Yeah, Marie? <clears throat> I really appreciate your coming here and telling, sharing your, your viewpoint on this very important issue of difference and, the, <clears throat> and how that difference uh, work plays into our ability to, to uh, uh, make decisions and understand each other. I wanted to share with you a quote from, uh, Baha from Baha'u'llah. Yes. In the Baha'i writings, he has a very similar quote. He says, God, if God had pleased, he surely could have made all men one people. Yeah. He chose instead to uh, uh, convey. To, excuse me. He chose instead to to allow the the pure in heart and the detached in spirit, by virtue of their own innate abilities, to rise uh, uh, and and in the. In the in their love for God, to be distinguished and separated from the wayward and the perverse. Mm -hmm. So that we had this distinction between the people who choose to be 
uh, following God's will and those who are wayward and perverse. Yeah. And that's one way of understanding the uh, the the, the introduction in, excuse me the introduction of free will uh, that that difference yeah. was was really put into the into the mix right the, from the beginning yeah. because he could have made us all one people that that was God's uh, power but he chose instead to make these di this difference possible yeah. so that the people who who, who, who can be distinguished by their, their good deeds. Yeah. And that's something that we have, we, we have the choice to do that or not. Right. And, I mean, and it allows for all, these, yeah. all the other elements that, that can play into people who don't make those good choices. Yes. There's a lot going on. I know. And this is, I think, where we go back to where Phil's question was that, um, so, and I, I think I tried to point out from that perspective, it's not a fair world, right? Like. Uh, are people um, perverse by choice, or is everybody born at a certain level and then it's only their choices that make it? But we are aware that circumstances do make a difference, right? So um, there's a verse in the Quran in which God says that, you know, the blind, there's no problem with the blind in doing this. Some, like, depending on what your capability is, stuff is not required of you in terms of uh, Sharia law, for example. So the, the Quran has a principle of recognizing people's abilities and only holding people accountable to the degree to which they have a certain level of free will. So I think it's important. I think the point you're making is a really interesting one. And I think it's worth pondering that, like who chooses to have or be born with a more open attitude towards the world? Is it something that only you work towards or, you know, being the father of young children, it is remarkable how much is nature and how little is nurtured from my perspective now. <laughs> you know, we're running our own controlled experiment. <laughs> same house, same people, you know, same parents, same schools, everything. And then you get these beings that are very different from each other. So there's definitely something that is brought in. And then within that, you know, in terms of the, the leg, you know, there's a, f a limited level of choice according to which we will definitely, I think, we are held accountable. It's, um, yeah. Um, I wanted to kind of reflect back that question. I'm curious to hear from any one of you about uh, what thoughts it might have given you about our situation. Are there any ideas or is something about our current situation where we are as a society and culture, has that been our meaning right now here in the U.S. I'm thinking just of the U.S. in terms of our cultural wars. Perhaps you can put it that way, and the differences that we have, virulent differences. Is there something here that helps? Is there something here that uh, reframes it, or are we where we started? <laughs> yes. I thought of the question before you said what you just said, so my question may not be relevant. So with apologies. Okay. Um, in relation to clothing and its function and symbolism yeah. with Adam and Eve, how do you resolve the current use of clothing as a messenger of social status, power, and sexuality. Wow. If I could get a $150,000 grant and two years, I would write a lovely book for you on that question. Um, yes, how to connect um, a basic principle perhaps can help us at least kind of point in one direction in this question is that no matter what we make, it becomes an extension of ourself. Could be our words, could be the tools, could be clothing. Whatever it is, it is connected to the story we tell ourselves or who we think we are. So there's no escape, I think, from not just clothing, but anything that we own to be a symbol of ourself and hence then be involved in competition, in certain kind of self-display in kind of presenting ourselves in a certain way uh, to, to the public. Um, so, um, 
So you can think of uh, clothes as language rather than using physical words. We try to communicate something by our clothes. And what we try to communicate depends on, you know, the language that is being spoken. So in a place where uh, people don't have many clothes, wearing tattered clothes is not a problem, right? In a poor place. But when Kanye wears a tattered shirt, you know, famous guy, then it becomes a fashion statement in the US. It's a really interesting, same thing in different places, just like a word in this context would mean one thing and the word in the other context would mean another. So I guess I'm arguing that we might think of clothing as a certain language that we're using. Yeah? I look at clothing as, in the natural world, the comparable to clothing, I think, is plumage, fur color, and the changing of the color of fur, feather color, and the, the colors and plumage of the animals communicate things. Yeah. For example, when a female uh, hyena is in heat, her color changes. So I look at clothing as the human version of plumage and a language of communicating to other humans. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, that's, I would totally agree. That's what I was trying to say to that. So that's one level of what can be communicated. Yeah. I want to go ahead to your question Please, yeah. there. I think uh, the word particularity that you used earlier yeah. kind of explains why we don't have a common... Uh, the whole thing about awareness of God, or whether you believe in God or not, the awareness of a larger reality than our self. I think uh, we're, we're caught up somehow in particularity and thinking that we're always defending ourself, loving ourself in some ways, but not extending that to in a bigger context. I don't know if that, I mean, what you've said tonight has sort of, I've sort of seen that hmm. uh, from the quotations that you've used that um, we're, we're too fixated on particularity, mm -hmm. that our, you know, my ideas are more important. Um, yeah. My, you're different. <laughs> Even that we call each other people different means yeah. we don't see the big picture of the oneness. Right. What is that? Is do we have a oneness? And if we don't, what might we create? In some ways, we had, you know, a national narrative, but you know, things have definitely kind of broken down, and there's multiple narratives now. What might a new narrative be? What might a new container be that might bring everybody together? Is there one? That's a big question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. To answer your question. Yes, please. I can, heart, I can hardly wait till the news tomorrow morning. And I'd like to try out your, look at this amazing thing. <laughs> 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 Great. Great. Amazing. Yes, right? There's a sense of wonder, right? It's, but there's also incapacity there, too. I mean, that's, well, I hope that came across. That for me in that moment, and I was, I guess, projecting maybe false consensus, but I was imagining that my father was feeling the same incapacity that I was feeling and being able to understand how can a person think this way. So in that phrase is that total, like, it, it's almost a response at when things have failed. It's kind of a giving up, you know? It's getting up, like, it is, this is amazing. So amazement, so wonder. <laughs> Well, I also, since I have the microphone, <laughs> um, I love that you said everything is a test. And that, that sort of removes that personal, uh, um, you know, just cellular reaction that you have to somebody who disagrees. But you think, okay, this is a test. How yeah. do I react to this? And I love this, that the purpose of difference is to play the game of good works. Good works, yes. That is really lovely. Yeah. So, 
Anybody else want to say something? <laughs> yeah, back there, yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just so easy to fall into this thought pattern of thinking that the whole world is deteriorating around us, and I certainly have a lot of anxiety around that, like watching the news and stuff, but thinking of it as something that was gifted to us by a higher power in order to test us is really powerful and really shifting the way that I think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I was raised Quaker, and uh, Quaker teachers emphasize that God is something that is with, um, innate within all of us. And yeah. so for me, that even says that it's as much as it's a test given to us by God, it's also a test given to us by ourselves in a spiritual sense, like the God within us, the collective God that is shared within all of us has given us this test and these challenges and these flaws that are just part of us that are um, as important to our experiences as anything else. Absolutely. Um, and that in this context, the small response of kind of being able to absorb and digest a harsh comment mm -hmm. is a contribution. Yeah. That's what I find really helpful about this. And this is not exactly in this context, but I was so taken by this as a teenager when I heard this. Um, one of the five pillars of Islam is, in addition to praying and fasting and pilgrimage, is giving charity for whatever you've left over after taking care of your needs. If stuff is left over, you're supposed to give a certain percentage of that to the poor. And preferably the poor people that you know, not just some anonymous thing. So it brings that personal relationship. And at the time of the Prophet, there were some of his friends, his companions, who were so poor they could barely afford the clothes on their back. That's all they had. And they were really sad. They were sad, and the Prophet asked them, why is that? Because he had just said that those who give charity will you know, receive such and such a reward. And they said, but we don't have money. So this good is escaping us. We won't be able to get the benefit of this good, you know? So they were sad about it. And the Prophet said to them, can't you smile? <laughs> Can't you. you smile, yes. And to now go back to Phil, your question. See, that's the level, Phil, at which this discussion is taking place. It is not in, the, in a philosophy class where like, we sit back, you know, even like when I would think of that kind of thing, I kind of you know, put my legs like this and flip back a little bit. It's not at that detachment. It's really in the game. You're in the game you're playing, and what's the decision you're going to make while you're sweating and hot and out of breath and lactic acid is making a leg skill, you know? So it's in the fifth set of your tennis game, Phil. That's where this has to happen. That's where the discussion is. How much free will do you have at that moment? So I would not make it abstract in that way. I would really bring it down to that level. This is what it's about. And this is one of my biggest discoveries over the period is that, oh boy, did I. Did they complicate it as an undergrad? And it's taken long years working with Rumi and other folks to realize this is not that complicated. It's very simple in that way. Yes, can't you smile? It's about that. It's about that decision. That's level free will, I think, that we do have. It would be hard to deny that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share um, a couple of things. Um, Yes, <laughs> that I wanted to perhaps, I think we're getting close to right our uh, finishing time, that another thing to think about is that rather than asking people to believe the same way, because that's one of the hardest things, or to think the same way, perhaps we can agree on what the good things are that we can do together. So rather than trying to find agreement on political views, possible to find folks who you totally disagree with and get them to agree to come and work with you in their neighborhood or come to your neighborhood and do some kind of a project. What is needed? Let's clean up the side of the street. But that could be a place where we could come together. So this is now my answer to what I was asking you guys. Like, so how might we do this without overcomplicating it? So rather than asking for a debate or a dialogue, let's just do simple things that we know are needed and do them together. That's a unifying factor, that need is bigger than us. We both agree to that common project and we go in there, right? And the other one is the power of as if. A few years ago I was going through uh, toll booths in Massachusetts and there were posters, I think, of uh, 
uh, a worker who uh, was a mother who used to work there and who, I guess, died and killed by a, a car. And there were posters up that said, drive as if your mother worked here. And that, I think, can be a really powerful practice. We could try and imagine people that we meet as members of our family. That could transform our relationships, too. Although, if you don't really get along with your family members and hate them, perhaps that's not a good idea. But, you know, it's as if that's really important there. Find somebody that you care about and use your imagination so we can train ourselves. Imagination is a technology through which we can train ourselves. It is clear now, based on research done in cognitive science, that when we read novels, same areas are lit up as it would be if you were actually doing the thing or if you were watching a movie or if you were dreaming. It's remarkable. The brain doesn't make a difference whether you think of something or you're doing something. The same stuff gets fired. So this is a trick behind, you know, people who uh, are uh, athletes who uh, are, uh, you know, have an injury, are out for four or five months and they come back and they're better than before. It's because they actually eliminated all the mistakes of working with the body and they're doing it perfectly in their head and they come back and their bodies are now, you know, they're better athletes than before. So imagination can really shape, we can train our minds and we can make those neural pathways. So the power of as if, treating each other as if we're family members, as if we care about each other. Oh. Um, were there any questions or I can share one other thing. Yes, go ahead. I, just, I have a situation that combines both um, your two suggestions. Yes. Um, when uh, my wife and I would have dinner with my father, um, she and he would talk politics and they would both agree on what had to be done, but they would differ sometimes vehemently about how to mm. do that thing. So that's sort of the first one. I think that's the problem is that yeah. a lot of people, we see problems, right? but we don't know. We disagree on how to. Unless the solve. cost is so high that it would be really horrible to do it both ways, why not do it both ways? Right? So I'm or thinking not, not of a huge off, right? project, right? I'm thinking more of simple things or like we could, could do it two different ways. Okay, let's try it both ways. Right. So we could walk with the other on their path and they can hopefully come walk on our path. Yeah. And you had another point you said? Well, no. That, that was it. Okay. combining both. All right. Well, thank you so much. And as always, thank you audience members for your great contributions to this evening. And if you haven't signed in using the iPad, they're still fired up back here at the counter, so you can do that. We do not have the study Koran in, the, in our collection, but we'll get it, I promise. <laughs> Thanks, and we'll save sir. it for Shelf.